What up, what up, Salvador Brigman here. Welcome back to the Crowdfunding Demystified Podcast. Now, let me ask you a question. What if you could actually discover the system that went into a mega raise, you know, $360,000 plus, $360,793? What if you could discover exactly what went into this, the principles that went into the launch, some of the advice that this individual had going into this campaign for others that are out there? What if you could really get access to all of that information? Because that's exactly what we're talking about on today's podcast episode. So on the Crowdfunding Demystified Show, my name is Salvador Brigman, and man, I love hosting this podcast. It's one of my favorite things that I do because I think it's so incredibly important to bring real world advice, education, information, and teachings to you directly so you can take action on this and you can raise more money from the crowd. We've had so many people who have come on my podcast after having been an actual listener of this show. I think that's a hallmark to me. That kind of shows just the impact that we're having. When we have people who come on the podcast and they were also a listener of the show, it shows that what we are teaching is working to get projects funded. So if nothing else, I'd say that that's one of my biggest wishes for you is that you're going to see massive success with your crowdfunding campaign by using some of the principles and some of the things that we teach on this show. And also, you're going to discover way more techniques, way more things that you can do when it comes to actually launching a campaign effectively. And you hear that directly from the guest's mouth, right? You hear what they are doing in order to drive funding, in order to drive interest and attention to their campaign. And that's something that you can only get when it comes to listening. Listening is such an important hallmark of being an entrepreneur, of being a creator, of putting something out there, of seeing success, you got to be willing to listen. And you also have to be listening to the right people. If you're listening to the wrong people, you can sometimes be actually headed in the wrong direction. So I try to bring on people who I think not only deliver that, but also will give you tons of resources when it comes to doing one of these campaigns. So we talked again today with an individual who was able to raise 360,000 plus a six figure campaign by the Nudie team. So we're going to get into that in just a second. But in addition, if you want to learn more about how to actually do one one of these races. If you kind of want to be, you know, go through the step-by-step -step process of like, what do I have to do? What do I have to do when it comes to different elements that Sal talks about? What, are the, what do I have to do when it comes to the strategy? What do I have to do from a more tactical standpoint? You definitely want to check out my free course on Kickstarter because that's kind of just, to me, holding your hand throughout that entire process. You should go to the link I'm about to mention because when you sign up for this free course, you're going to get access to tons of incredible information, training, etc. And I make it all free just to help you when it comes to doing one of these raises. So you can go to this link I'm about to mention at crowdcrux.com slash Kickstarter. That link is C-R-O-W-D-C-R-U-X.com slash Kickstarter. Crowdcrux.com slash Kickstarter will take you there and you can learn more about that free course. Just enter your name and email and you can start uh, tr your training, you can start investing in your education when it comes to your time, your energy, and make sure again that you're listening to the right sources. In addition, for those of you that are like, you know what, Sal, just give it to me. I want the game plan. I want the playbook. I want the blueprint, right? Man, you are a perfect fit for the Kickstarter launch formula. The Kickstarter launch formula is one of my best-selling books. It's available on Amazon. It's available on Audible. So many people have said incredible things about that book. And as well, I think that it's almost kind of like a ritual where I've had so many people who have also listened to that book or read that book and then be successful with a campaign. So there is a little bit of magic sauce, I think, when it comes to the Kickstarter launch formula. But also, it's really just the tried and true bedrock. A lot of the techniques that people don't talk about necessarily publicly in this niche, I've really codified that. I've designed what works and put that into a formula for you to follow. And then you can be successful with a campaign. And again, that's a very low entry book. So if you want to check out that book, you can go to crowdcrux.com slash Kickstarter audio. And Link will take you to Audible where you can actually get a free copy of the Kickstarter launch formula. You just got to do a free 30-day trial of Audible. You get a free copy of the Kickstarter launch formula. So go to crowdcrux.com slash Kickstarter audio. That link is C-R-O-W-D, C-R-U-X.com slash Kickstarter audio, crowdcrux.com slash Kickstarter audio. Without further ado, let's get into today's podcast episode and discover how this team was able to raise over $360,000 on Kickstarter from more than 4,300 baggers. And it's coming up right after this. If you're worried about the fulfillment and shipping part of your Kickstarter campaign when it comes to getting out all those perks and rewards to your backers, rest assured I've put together a complete Kickstarter fulfillment and shipping checklist for you, and it's free. This is sponsored by the folks at FulfillRight, and they thought that you should have this checklist as part of your arsenal going into a crowdfunding campaign. If you want to get instant access to this checklist and it's free, you can go to fulfillright.com slash checklist. Again, that is F-U-L-F-I-L-L-R-I-T-E dot com slash checklist. 
fulfillright.com slash checklist. Just go to that link and you can download it immediately. Hey guys, welcome back to the Crowdfunding Demystified Podcast. And we have a two-time successful Kickstarter creator on the show with their most recent project, having attracted over 300,000, more than 3,900 backers. Also having done another mega launch. This is also for backless bra size C2H cup. And I'll let the creator tell you a little bit more about that on the show today. We are privileged enough to have them here. Annette, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Happy to be here. Do you think we can get started? Maybe you can kind of introduce your history a little bit to the audience, this other campaign that you ran, and just let them know a little bit about you. Sure, sure. Well, my project, first of all, is fashion-based, and I actually come from a full career in the fashion industry. And so coming to crowdfunding to launch our first product, which was the Nudie T system, it is boobwear not a bra, really, innov- this is really about innovation. And it took us such a long time to create the product to actually do the design work and and the innovation around it, because it's, it's never been done before. So we actually had to come up with ways to manufacture it. We were so anxious to get it out in the world. And we knew that it would it would have to be women that were eager for something new. And so we decided to launch on Kickstarter. And that was three years ago with our first product. And it was a huge success. We did 750000 in a 30-day campaign, which was essentially our goal. And that we rolled it over to Indiegogo and did another 200000 uh, in the ensuing months after that. Um, Congratulations. That's huge. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it was great to reach our goal. And so because we're a company of centered around innovation, bras are just basically they're in they're doing different iterations of the same product. We set out the backless nudie is really something that you will not find anywhere in this bra or boobwear space. And so we wanted to go back again to people that are eager for something new, which is the crowdfunding audience. And and what were you doing? So you mentioned working in the fashion industry before. Were you working for a company? Were you doing another yeah. company that you own? What were you doing before you launched this product? How, well, I've been around for a while. So I've done, I was in the business of fashion, never in the design of fashion. So I ran successful companies large and small. The last person I worked for was Donna Karen. I helped her build her private company called Urban Sen. So I've been in like larger companies, but my my love was really kind of startup, whether it was with a, a big name like Donna Karen or my own businesses, which I've had along the way. I really like that startup where you can and really make a difference and you really see the you really see the results of your work. So I was always in the business of fashion, but having said that, I created the first nudie out of my desperate need to wear a wedding dress and that was back in 2011. I was going to ask you, yeah, so when it comes to the, the problem there and this way you're bringing innovation to fashion, there's a lot of ways you can do that. You can obviously um, work for other companies, bring together new products. What made you so passionate or what made you really focus on that problem that you wanted to solve yourself with your own company, your own startup? Yeah. Well, you know, women inherently the first layer of your clothing. So what am I going to wear under this piece of clothing has been an issue for, for forever. I mean, and I saw that within the retail space, designers do not design clothing for bras. So that's why when women are looking for something to wear under clothing, a lot of times they don't find it. So they go to tape, they go, I mean, just like so many different, there's so many different issues around that. So when I created the first nudie, I had a very skin bearing, super sheer wedding dress and nothing worked underneath it. And so I just said, I wonder if I can make something. And I took a fabric never used for the top half of the body. And I made my first nudie. And I realized when I made it, I didn't set out to create a bra because that's not what I needed. I just needed a thin layer that hugged that so I, I could dance and I feel like I had a little bit of coverage between myself and my guest at my wedding. And that's what nudie was. And when I put it on my body, I realized like, wow, I don't look like I have anything on. I look like myself. I almost look like I'm braless, but I'm not. And that was a space that was untapped. And so nudie is mm. really creating a completely new category between bra and braless. Mm. And I like to say for guys, it's like leggings are to pants. It 
fits mm. the same part of the body, but it is doesn't feel the same, doesn't look the same, and it also doesn't live in your life in the same way that pants do. Like yeah, I mean, it sounds like in. you have a very creative way, also of kind of addressing that, and also create the first prototype yourself, right? That's that's yes. crazy, and yeah. the fact that you can do that, and um, also begin to see the potential of it, I think that says a lot about your creative vision. What made you decide to kind of tap into this new way of bringing the product to market using crowdfunding and Kickstarter as opposed to launching it in a more traditional way? Yeah, well, again, it was three and a half years of just doing all the testing and then to, to make it manufacturable. And we were, I had never been actually a backer on crowdfunding, but I had been following crowdfunding and we basically wanted to shoot it out of a cannon. Right. So it's like, what audience is going to have the appetite for this? And like, how can we do it really quickly? And that's really, if you do it well, that is the crowdfunding platform, right? They are these, this audience is just so eager to find something new. So they were perfect for our first adopters. And, and the timing was also right. The beauty of it. So especially with Kickstarter is that Kickstarter is still predominantly men, though I think it may be growing in terms of the audience. And so when we were building out our campaign, we knew that we needed to touch that audience as well. And we actually had quite a lot of male backers in our first campaign. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, I think that would be one big thing. I have a lot of female entrepreneurs and creators who will come to me and be like, Sal, I feel like Kickstarter is mainly men. Is my product going to work? Right. Yeah. And I think yeah. you're a great example of having kind of tapped into that audience as well. Yeah, it was really thrilling, actually. And just I'm on WeFunder now also. So we're actually doing two campaigns at once, equity crowdfunding. And y'all are busy. Um, yes, we are very busy. And, uh, you know, it's, and it's interesting as a woman centric company on WeFunder, we're also getting a lot of men. They, they feel the pain points that the women, their women have, and they are willing to like step up and invest. It's really interesting. So you're, you're doing both of these campaigns at the same time. Yes. Uh, and on WeFunder, it looks like you raised around 200K or so, so far when it comes to that project. Yes. yes. That takes so much coordination. So first of all, kudos yes. for doing that. <laughs> it takes a We're lot tired. of... tired. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a lot of spinning plates, right? A lot, a lot of moving plates and pieces for sure. Oh, mm -hmm. sorry. Yeah, I just oh, wanted no, to say it was very go. strategic that, that we did both at the same time because we saw how our investors, it was really thrilling to be on Kickstarter the first time, to be an investor looking in and seeing those numbers and seeing how people were eager for the product. And so we wanted to... To, we started WeFunder before we started Kickstarter a month before. So we wanted to give the people that were interested in investing a chance to like be part of that excitement when we launched Kickstarter. Do, do you feel like that process is similar? Is it very different? How do you feel like WeFunder is comparing to Kickstarter in terms of your experience? Well, I mean, one is equity crowdfunding, right? So, but you know, it's, it's wonderful because the community round starts at a minimum of a hundred. So it is similar, but different. And I have to have to be honest, I thought it would be more women that would be investing like, oh, it's a hundred dollar minimum investment. So women could invest in a company that they love to buy products from. Mm -hmm. But there's still a lot of fear with women and in investing. I mean, that's a whole other topic I could go into. So that was one of the things I was really surprised about. I was really hoping that like women would take ownership of companies that they, yeah, that they helped to build from the outside. Yeah, I mean, I think that's also, you know, honestly, just there needs to be more education, more awareness out there. And I don't think a lot of people don't know yet, right? Yes. About equity crowdfunding. Like we recently had on W Marketplace, that campaign, yes. they did like 1.4 million. And th there was just a lot of handholding that they were saying. Yes, yes, yes. So I think oh. there's just a little bit of gap when it comes to that. Yeah, for sure. And actually, I was speaking with those women. I, we're probably going to collaborate together. But yeah, it, it is a very different thing. And then you are getting some perks, but people are not investing for the perks on, on WeFunder. They're really doing it because they believe that they can, they believe in the company and they believe they can make a good financial decision and make money. So, so of all the different things that you're doing, what would you say that you are most proud of or that you stands out in your mind? You think back on this experience that you've had either of the Kickstarter, the WeFunder, this entire journey you've been on. What do you feel like you've been most proud of when you begin to think about that? Sticking with the vision. So, I mean, like I said before, the first nudie was born in 2011. That's a long time ago. <laughs> so that's the one thing I'm most proud of, like really. And that was before its time. 
I mean, I it, the prototype sat in my uh, safe for five years, and then I found I I actually partnered with somebody that could help me make the prototypes real. But it's like keeping that vid- vision, and then waking up every morning as excited as you were when you first put on your body ten years ago. I'm proud of that. Mm. So basically, kind of sticking to that original vision, not only to build the product into something that you know you're proud of, but also to impact a lot of other people, right? Correct. And to be able to kind of offer this alternative solution, it sounds like. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. You have to have fire to be in this business. You cannot, and it has to come from inside of you. It cannot come from the outside because if you don't, you are going to just burn out, and it's going to be for naught. So. For, for some of the other female entrepreneurs out there, I mean, just looking through this current campaign that you're running on Kickstarter, you have so many people that are singing your praises and you've got on the New Yorker, you've had people write about you on Vogue, BuzzFeed, et cetera. I think a lot of women entrepreneurs can look at this and they'd be like, this seems unattainable. Are there any kind of tips or advice you would share for someone in the audience who might be excited, you know, get inspired by your success, obviously want to participate as well, but kind of wondering like, how could I maybe launch a campaign someday? Are there any tips or advice you could pass on when it comes to the Kickstarter process? Yeah, it is a science. Number one, you've got to, because I've actually spoken with a a few women that have launched campaigns who have come to me to, you know, ask for advice. Number one, you, you really need to be truthful about your product. Like, like what's the, what's your audience? Is it large enough? You do need to have money. Like you need to have money to advertise. It's a lot of work. There's a lot of people that think, oh, I can just put this up in a week or so. And, da, da, da. you know, it's we had three months of solid work, writing and rewriting, shooting videos, et cetera. So my advice is take it really seriously, really mm-hmm. seriously, because you have a great opportunity it is like fast forward retailing. That's what I, that's I mean, I used to be in the retail world, but it's like doing a year's worth in, you know, a month. That's what mm-hmm. it's like. Yeah. And obviously you're kind of compressing the execution in such a short, short timeline and then the fulfillment, yes. right? So in, in a lot of ways, you're getting a, a lot done in a very short period of time, as Correct. you said. Yeah. Yeah. And so people, I think a lot of people going into it are not really thinking about like, a year's worth in in a month. And so they think it's, they take it very lightly. When it comes to this, you see people that are supporting the product before it's even been created. Do you feel like that's kind of different than traditional retail? I mean, you think about traditional retail, people getting it right then and they ordered online. It's in like two days, right? How do you feel like the person who's supporting your campaign is different from some of those other kind of buyers? Yeah. I mean, they, well, I can't say all of them, but a lot of them really know the process of this is really like a pre-order. And so a lot of them understand that they're backers and they're backing a a mission, not just like receiving a product. That's what I loved about it, especially at the first time, because nobody knew us. It's like they really tapped into the emotional side of what Nudie's about, which is basically allowing women to reclaim their natural shape. And so like to start your company like that with that sort of community that really is rallying towards that purpose is so strong. And when it comes to reclaiming your natural shape, what do you feel like that allows people to do? Or what do you feel like that kind of impact that has? Yeah, well, inherently bras were created to reshape women. And every man knows that women hate bras. (laughs) That's like just a known thing. And women hate bras because they have been reshaping them. And we have been told that our boobs are not all right in their natural form, that they they need to be lifted. They need to be pushed in. They need to ha- not have nipples. They need to look round. They need to look a certain way. And so Nudie is telling women, it is you are fine exactly the way you are because Nudie actually hugs your natural shape. And we're not here to reshape you. You can reclaim your shape. That's super powerful because that goes right back to body acceptance. So we're doing something really big here, which is going up against the whole bra industry and saying, that's bullshit. We don't Mm -hmm. need to be shaped. Thank you very much. We're going to reclaim our bodies. Yeah, I think that's super powerful. Even just looking at your social media, I mean, so many people seem to be rallying around you when it comes to your Instagram account, when it comes mm. to your Facebook, right? What do you feel like has been the most powerful channel for you specifically when it comes to driving attention and awareness with this kind of fashion product? Has it been Instagram? Has it been email? What do you feel like has been the most powerful channel for you? 
I mean, Instagram's been great. We just had a nice uptick in uh, TikTok, which has been, TikTok is still kind of fairly unknown. We don't, we did a little bit of advertising on there, but we're just now with our Kickstarter um, campaign videos, we've been doing clips. We've seen a huge uptick now. We, some of our videos have up to close to 100,000 views. That's really helped us a lot. But it's kind of interesting. I did a, I was in a series of commercials for a company called Clearco. They're out of Canada. They do um, financing for startups. And um, they featured me in some commercials that have been running for the past month. And I, I've never really been out there in anything like super public with a founder story. But that has brought in so much business for us. It's it's really interesting. It's like, oh, maybe we should really, people really want to kind of know what the story is. How did this happen? And you know, that there's a real person behind it and the audience really connected with that. So that was very Mm -hmm. interesting. So I think we're going to actually try some ads now with... with Have you ever seen that movie Joy out of curiosity? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Love it. It it kind of makes me think about that a little bit. It's like almost when you have the founder who understands the problem so intimately, people get so excited about that. Yeah. Yeah, and sometimes I just not I some big on, faceless yes, corporation or correct. something like that, right? And yeah, and that's very much how we market. So our team, we're you know we're not that big. We're actually six now, but our team will do live streams when we're doing photo shoots, and our team is there. How do we wear our nudie? But you know, it's like we are real people. We're women of all ages, of all sizes, of all colors, and uh, we want that transparency because again, starting on Kickstarter, you're really starting with community. I loved the first Kickstarter because there were only three of us on our team and I got to like be answering people's their, their question in real time and really getting a chance to connect with them and see what their pain points are, questions they had. And that's a very special time when you're building a company to be in touch with were there Were there any ripple effects that came from that first Kickstarter? Because I know so many people not only get on you know media attention, might get approached by Shark Tank, might have mm-hmm. investors that kind of see that. What were some of the ripple effects of that first project you did? Yeah, well, you know, we got again, we got to start from like zero to having 14,000 customers and it, it rippled. So when we finished Indiegogo, which was our second campaign, and we had everybody, everybody got their perks, we then opened our website. And then for two months, all we did was allow our backers to reorder before we went out into the world. Because at that point, they had been the first set of people they may have had nudie for like five months and so it was wonderful we just you know just opened our doors and did an email and said hey okay we're open and that's great so that's one big ripple effect is that we just had to we just could tap into that but you know of course when i'm pitching investors like vcs everything i mean i'd say this was our success 750 in in 30 days that's huge Mm -hmm. you know and then right out of the market fourteen thousand customers also huge. And then just being able to build on that so that it has had a ripple effect, but VCs are a tough crowd. They're like, okay, well then, then what can you do it on e-commerce? So, you Mm -hmm. know, (laughs) yeah, 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 definitely. I mean, one of the questions I also had for you is having just your toes in a lot of different industries. Do you feel like there are any things when it comes to your career that you want to pass on advice wise? So for example, other people out there who haven't managed as big projects as you have, what has been your approach to like leadership or Do you have any thoughts you want to pass on to someone who is really trying to get to where you are when it comes to the team building, managing aspect? Because it sounds like you have everything kind of working very in a well-oiled machine, right? Behind closed doors. Well, I don't know about that, but I have a great team. I really have a great team. And the way that I approach my team is as a leader, I am really there to give them the tools to succeed. We have a collective way of deciding things. So everybody is like weighing in on everything because as a small team, you need that. Like if I'm not here, somebody else can do my job. If they're not here, somebody. So we're really weighing in and making uh, decisions. And what is thrilling because my team is like they're in the 20s and 30s. So they do have some experience, but it's wonderful to be able to affect your daily, you know, your daily workings affect the company as a whole. And that's super Mm -hmm. rewarding for them. So we're really building this together. And I I like to say to them that each one of them could be a CEO. 
I, I really find that very interesting because I think a lot of other people kind of delegate right to their team. It's more of like a boss versus employee mentality, but it sounds like you're kind of creating together or almost co-working together on this vision, right? Yes. And you're yeah, kind of doing sure. it in that collective team manner instead. Yeah. And I'm, you know, I am, I'm older, so I'm over 50. So I defer to my team that's 20 and 30, but because there's a lot of cultural thing I'm just not up on. I think I am. And I'll defer to them in a lot of times, like this is your, because our biggest customer base is 25 to 45. So I'll defer to them in with certain things for sure. Yeah. I mean, that, that's really interesting to me as well, because a lot of the times we have people who are trying to start campaigns that maybe don't have every kind of expertise, right? And they're like, Sal, how do I get this done if I'm not super good at this or super good at that? And it sounds like what you're saying is it's really important to tap into the talents of the people around you, right? Yeah. Yes. And yeah. And then, and then if we don't... Guiding light. Correct. And then not everybody knows everything. And if they don't, they learn it. You know, like, this is a huge learning. I said, this is your... Everybody's getting their MBA here. <laughs> so hands <laughs> yeah. down. And you get paid. You get paid to get your MBA right now. And they've all really, they've shown that they have the ability to do that. It's really thrilling. Um, so first of all, where can people go to learn some more about your Kickstarter campaign? We can also, I can link up your WeFunder as well, but where can they go for your Kickstarter campaign? So um, the Kickstarter campaign, if you look up Nudie System, N-U-D-I-I System, you'll find both of our campaigns. And so you'll just go to the one which is Backless Nudie, C to H Cups, which is running only until Friday. Great, great. And in terms of your WeFunder, so just Google that or... Yes. Yeah, so they can also put in Nudie System, N-U-U-D-I-I System, and they can find our, our WeFunder, which is closing in July. Great. So I'll be sure to link that up. So just one or two more follow-up questions. My first is, it sounds to me like one of the things that you've been very successful at is building a crowd. And one of the things that you've mentioned is having a vision, have a very strong vision that people can kind of connect with. Do you think there are any other things you would add on to that in terms of how you've been able to build a crowd from literally zero, right? A goose egg into this huge movement of people that are now supporting your Kickstarters or going into WeFonder, supporting your equity campaigns. What do you feel like really it takes or any thoughts on building a crowd? I think being real, like, again, people want to be seen. They want to be spoken to. So in in all aspects of like marketing and how we're out there in the world, we try to keep things real. I think that's really helped us a lot, whether it's a customer service, you know, person going out and answering a question or somebody responding to somebody online on Instagram. I think that that has really helped us. This is a a new time. And if you're really going to go up against these big corporations that have lots of money for advertising, you know, you can make decisions and you can like you can keep your culture pure in a smaller sense when you have a smaller company and so we're we use that as our edge to to keep building our company love it love it and my final question for you is for someone who is listening to this podcast you can speak directly to them and we can end on this note um if you can leave them either with a word of inspiration it could be a quote it could be a bit of advice that you've gotten in the early days anything along those lines or even something you wish you knew when you're kind of starting this journey and we can end mm-hmm. on that note. yeah i love the saying there's no one way and so there's a, and every time I see that, I have actually a visual of being like water. There's going to be obstacles in no matter what you do, but there's no one way. So just be like water, find the crack to like move around. And there's, and I like to say this, like we didn't have big VC backing, right? So we went to the people, right? Mm-hmm. The VCs aren't going to back us. We're going to go to the people. So there's no one way to build your business. There's Clerco. We love them. They've been there for inventory financing. There's money out here. You just have to have, you just have to have the fire for building your company and then know that you have an audience on the other end of it. Love it. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Really appreciate all of your advice and look forward to seeing how your two campaigns uh, turn out here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me exciting.
Thank you for listening to this episode of the Crowdfunding Demystified Podcast. My name is Salvador Brigman. Thank you so much for joining me on this episode, investing a little bit of time in your training, in your education. Man, you got to always be obviously investing in kind of just getting to the forefront of what's working today when it comes to crowdfunding. The more that you can do that, the more that you can train, the more that you can actually just dedicate yourself to lifelong learning and also getting the right information, the faster you're going to see success in literally any area of your life. The more that you develop your skills when it comes to crowdfunding and the way, if you're willing to actually change the way you think, the more successful that you can be. You know, this is really, in my opinion, about thinking big because for so many people out there, so many of my audience members, so many of my students, this is the first time you're actually doing a crowdfunding campaign. But when you begin to study what the successful people have in common by listening to the episodes of this show, it almost makes it like a no-brainer. You start to just unlock different pieces of the puzzle, put them together, and you're like, okay, I understand now exactly what I got to do. So you want to study people, right? You want to study study what the successful people have in common. And the more that you can do that, the more that you're just going to really clearly understand what you got to do next. However, sometimes there's just a little bit more ambiguity, right, when it comes to the process. And that's kind of one of the things where when I start to actually incorporate coaching into my work. So I've been in this industry since 2012. I started my podcast in 2015. And one of the things that's kind of been a hallmark of what I've been doing is allowing people to have access, right? I think that giving people access is one of the most important things in terms of getting them closer to that proximity of success. Sometimes you feel like you don't have access, right? And it can be one of the most disempowering experiences of your entire life. So one of the things I've always wanted to do is to give my listeners and give readers and give students access. So I do these one-on-one coaching calls where you can actually get access directly to me. And whether that's getting feedback on different elements of your work, giving you a complete blueprint when it comes to your specific product category, what you're trying to do in terms of the launch, things you might not even know, introduce to people in the industry, resources, tools, homework, action items, all that kind of stuff we do on an intensive one-on-one coaching call. And I also obviously have longer term coaching programs. I also help people when it comes to a one-on-one client basis. Uh, if I believe in their campaign, I think it's something that's going to change the world in some way. It's going to be a really big campaign. I'm always more than willing to talk about that. But if you want to learn more about this one-on-one coaching call thing I do, you can go to the link I'm about to mention. You can schedule a one-on-one coaching call with me. That link is at crowdcrux.com slash coaching. Just go to crowdcrux, C-R-O-W-D-C-R-U-X.com slash coaching. Give me a little bit of information about you. Tell me what you're trying to accomplish. Tell me about your project a little bit to make sure we use that time effectively. Again, that link is crowdcrux.com slash coaching. And that is one of the first steps, I'd say one of the best investments that you can make aside from my book, The Kickstarter Launch Formula. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode of the podcast. My name is Sal, and I've got one final parting word for you. Take some action. Take some action this week, whether that's doing something small, whether that's even just setting up a Kickstarter account or browsing some campaigns or backing a little bit. Take some action this week, and I'll be so proud if you do that. And if you did enjoy this episode, give me a positive rating review on Spotify or on iTunes, wherever you're listening to this, or give me a thumbs up on YouTube, whatever it is, just show a little bit of love. And thank you so much for doing that. Again, my name is Sal, and I will see you next time.